So thus far in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel has had uh, quite a, uh, an experience. Um, he had a, a vision with regard to the glory and, and the awesomeness and presence of God. Probably needed that uh, experience um, because of the hard task ahead of him and the fact that uh, he was pronouncing to the captives in um, in Babylon uh, the complete annihilation of the um, the Jewish culture and the Jewish infrastructure there in, in Jerusalem. Um, now he uh, in in the section of the scripture that we're looking at this morning, he has declared that he's going to be a watchman. God had already revealed to him that these people that he's going to be talking to, is going to be ministering to, are hard-headed. They're probably not going to listen. And that probably implied that he, he needed, there needed to be a, a uh, that he needed to attack it from multiple approaches. And we're going to see some of those approaches in the fourth and fifth chapters of, of um uh, Ezekiel, where he uses some symbols uh, to get his message across. So um, he, in in the uh, beginning in um, the seventeenth verse, he says, "The Son of Man," and, and uh, we mentioned the last week that the Son of Man is used in reference to him uh, ninety-two times in in the book. It says, "Son of Man, I've made thee a watchman." Under the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. So he's a watchman. Um, he's a, I, I think, more than just a traffic cop. He's probably more than just somebody that's out on the wall of Jerusalem surveying the landscape uh, and, and giving a warning to the uh, inhabitants within the wall. He's a watchman. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. It's interesting that in, in the book of Jeremiah, he was, um, uh, there, there was very minute details given about how the Jews persecuted him. They threw him in jail. They threw him, they threw him in the, ju the dungeon. Um, uh, they, they beat him. Uh, but there isn't much of a record of any like that happening to Ezekiel, although uh, he said these people are hard-headed and they're probably not going to listen to you. And the, the very name Ezekiel has to do with, with toughness, um, you know, and, and so he, he was made tough by God to face this, this, um, this group of, of people. But he was a, a watchman. And then in verse, seven, in verse 18 he says, when I say unto the wicked... Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn that wicked from his way, wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Now you talk about putting pressure on a person. That's a lot of pressure. Yet, if thou warn the wicked, and he turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he should die. He turn not from his wickedness, wicked way. He should die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. The pressure was on him, regardless of whether the audience was um, hard-headed, hard-hearted, um, whatever. Regardless, he had a message to deliver, and it was incumbent upon him to deliver that message. And if he didn't, the consequences were um, pretty severe. Now, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity... And I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sins, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. 
but his blood will I require at thy hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous uh, sin not, and he doth not sin, he sh shall surely live. Let's read that again. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous, uh, the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. Now, I wonder how this squares, or I wonder how this relates to the Great Commission. What is the primary, the dominant responsibility of the church and members of the church? Is it not to evangelize? Is it not to uh, warn the wicked? In the paper a couple of weeks ago in the, in the dispatch, there was a full, a full page of a listing of churches that were welcoming to folks who have an unscriptural lifestyle. A whole page of churches in the Columbus area that it was a, it was a, a welcome to people who have a unscriptural lifestyle. Now what about that? I mean, isn't that a sad situation? I read that and I thought, isn't this sad? That instead of pointing out scripture with regard to the lifestyle, they're welcoming him, welcoming them. It um, really relates to what Ezekiel is saying here, or what he, he, what the commission that he had. And that commission was to warn people who have an unscriptural lifestyle. Um, the, the the main focus of of the church ought to be evangelism. It's great to have benevolence. It's great to have all kinds of programs. But the, the, the main focus of the church is evangelism. Is that right? That, that, and, 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 the, and the pressure is on. <laughs> the pressure was on Ezekiel. The pressure is on the church. The pressure is on individuals. Now, that's, um, th this is pretty sobering stuff. I don't think that commission was just to Ezekiel. It was to all the ministers. And in the New Testament era, it's, it's to, to all people. And so uh, the, it's really, this is really sobering stuff. This isn't just, it is his history, but, it, but, it, but it's really sobering, isn't it? it, it, it it's sobering that the, 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 the purpose of those that are... Uh, members of the kingdom is to evangelize. Now, after he was given that commission, and we need to think about that now and next week and about the watchman, but, but moving on, and the hand of the Lord was there upon me, Ezekiel says, and he said unto me, Arise and go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Now, the plain here probably had to do with, you know, a, a valley between uh, uh, hills or mountains. But he says, now you, you remove yourself. He got, this, he got this message. You're a watchman. You've got, you've got, to, be, you've got to be diligent. And then he goes, he, he, he goes into a, a valley, and, and God says, I'm going to talk to you there again after the after this commission I'm going to talk to you again 
Then I arose, Ezekiel says, and went forth into the plain, uh, the valley, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there as the glory which I saw by the river of Chebar. And I fell on my face. So, you remember in chapter 1 about the, uh, the uh, God's presence being there before um, Ezekiel and about this uh, multifaceted uh, 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 instrumentality? Well, it came again. I wonder, I wonder why Ezekiel need that, needed that reinforcement. He apparently needed some reinforcement there because he arose and he went. Behold, the glory of the Lord. And, of course, all of that vision, that rather complicated vision, all of it related to giving um, uh, um, Ezekiel a sense of the glory of of God and, and, and an indication of his presence, his presence in, in human affairs, his presence in, in, in the nation of Israel, his presence with regard to the captives, with regard to what was happening in, in Jerusalem, the idea that God was behind everything here. He was in control. God was sovereign, is sovereign and is in control. That, that seems to be the message here. Then he fell on his face, and that, that happened in chapter 1, when the first time he had this vision. Then the Spirit, and he fell, you know, fell this the second time. Then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me and said unto me, Go. Shut thyself within thine house. Now, this is interesting. Be a watchman. Then you, he goes to a, a different venue. God appears to him again in, in that vision, uh, that, that, with that, uh, vi that instrumentality that he, he had. And then he says, you go home and close the door. Now that seems interesting, doesn't it? Go and close the door. Um, then the Spirit entered in me and set me upon my feet and spake unto me and said unto me, Go, close the door, shut thyself within thine house. But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee. Well, what's that mean? They're going to put you under house arrest. You're going to be bound. You're going to be um, arrested. You're going to be you're going to be watched. Your movements are going to be controlled by by the by the mob, so to speak. Here, and thou shalt not go out among them. Stay at home. Now that, again, be a watchman over here and get some more instruction, go home. Now that's, uh, of course, that wasn't a permanent situation, but you go home for a while. And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth. I don't think God just made his tongue so he couldn't talk. It was just that he, at this point in his ministry, he was not to be out there, you know, um, uh, speaking to them, he he was he was to be, and and it may have been that that God just c caused him not to be able to speak, um, but because um, it says here, thou shalt be dumb, and that in the sense that uh, you know you're not going to be interacting here with these people, and thou shalt be taken, thou shalt not be to them a reprover at this point in his ministry. He's not going. He, he's he's instructed. You're not. You're not going to be out there criticizing them and uh, pre teaching them of their wrongdoing. You're just uh, for the for the time being. And and I don't. You know, we don't know the circumstances here. You know, they're, here's cap. They're in captivity. The Babylonian captivity. We don't know how they were treated, but they certainly weren't served uh, steak and eggs. You know, for breakfast. Um, 
they, they certainly had some uh, uh, situations that weren't, weren't acceptable or, or weren't good, but they were still a rebellious house. Verse 27, and when I speak with thee, now thou, so that, that was going to be a temporary thing, that is him not, not uh, speaking to them, but when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear. For they are a rebellious house. This is not the first time that um, uh, Ezekiel heard these words here about, you know, maybe they'll hear, maybe they won't. Um, now, that brings us to chapter 4. Chapter 4 and 5, uh, in chapters 4 and 5 of Ezekiel, uh, there are some um, symbols that he's to be using. Uh, he, he's going to teach these, these um, rebellious, this rebellious house by some symbols. Um, and there are four of those symbols that he, he's going to be using in chapter 4 and 5. Um, interesting uh, kind of, uh, you know, way of preaching or uh, teaching. In verse 1 of chapter 4 it says, and Thou also, son of man, that go across that son of man, take thee a tile. Now here's the first symbol. Take thee a tile or a brick. Um, some kind, and I, you know, we don't, know much about the size of that it might have been you know a big structure it might have been a small tablet we don't know but you take a tile a brick uh, some kind of a clay probably clay figure structure and lay it before thee and portray upon it the city even Jerusalem now um, what what What's this about? We're going to have a, the, the minister having some kind of a structure, and he's going to, on their structure, he's going to have a, kind of, a, kind of a, a map of an outline of Jerusalem. Now, is that an effective way of getting attention? How did Martin Luther King get attention with regard to civil rights kind of issues? I mean, he, he didn't you know, have, have this sort of thing. He got attention by his eloquence, right? His speech, his, his um, you know, moving about the, the country here. Now, um, there are other ways of getting, what are some other way, ways of getting attention? I'd be glad when these masks come down, have, uh, or have gone, so we can have some uh, more, uh, you know, um, uh, some dialogue. But what, what are some other ways of getting attention? Well, I remember Billy Inman. None of you remember. You don't, you're, you're not that old. Uh, but Billy Inman was the, uh, he, he was the fair manager, and he forbid certain people with certain lifestyles from uh, having a booth at the fair, and he got fired. Now, he could have gone across the state you know, uh, talking about this issue, but what did he do? He he set up a tent on the, got a permit, set up a tent on the on the camp on the state house lawn, and was there for camped out there for. Ned, you remember that? No, see, I'm I'm just checking. You're all young young pups. Um, he he camped out there for oh weeks, and got a lot of media attention lot of attention and and people you know pass by well how you doing you know and that sort of thing that's that's a way of you know he's not he's not really out there public speaking he's making a statement now you know Gandhi and in, um, in, in India um, changed the politics of India by what now, you're not too young to remember that from your history. You're not too old or young. 
he, he started this idea of peaceful protests, right? And got attention from all over the globe. So this may have been a very effective way of teaching these captives, these rebellious people. Um, so, so what was the nature of this, this um, um, clay tablet, ta this clay structure, this, this tile, uh, this, this, um, this brick, whatever it was? Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile, brick, some kind of a clay structure, and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. So he's, you know, he's got, must, I, I think it must have been a big structure. So he, he gets, um, he, out, he kind of lays out the city of Jerusalem, and lays siege against it, and build a fort against it. Now he's, now, not only laying out Jerusalem, he's, he's got some things outside of Jerusalem. He's told to get some things outside of him. A fort against it. And cast a mound against it. So he's got, I suppose, mounds of soil. Um, cast a mound, against, a mound against it. And set the camp also against it. The camp, the forces. And set battering rams. Those are military instruments of the, the enemy set uh, rams against it around about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, some kind of a, probably a flat pan that they bake, used for baking uh, bread or whatever they baked. You put this pan, um, this iron, between thee and the city. You can imagine this situation now we got some kind of a pan here um, between uh, Ezekiel and the city and it shall be um, and set thy face against it and it shall be besieged and thou shalt lay siege against it this shall be the sign this shall be a sign to the house of Israel now what's the sign Probably this iron pan uh, was to portray that God is not going to, you're not going to get through to God. God has separated himself from Jerusalem. In his divine justice he set up the rules and the rules and, and, and it was being carried out in his complete destruction of Jerusalem it was carried out and there wasn't anything that the Jews could do about it at that time there was, a, there was an iron piece between the Jews and God God and the Jews no way they had crossed the Rubicon. You've heard that expression, haven't you? Or are you too young? Uh, you've, you understand the historical significance of crossing the Rub Rubicon, right? You don't? Well, you should. You should have been reading that in history. Uh, you must have missed that course. That they was a point of no return, in other words. Right? Uh, done. And you thought, well, well that, that's, pretty, that's pretty severe. Well, let's suppose, um, uh, let's suppose that, we, that as a society we had, we had a law that says, you know, if you, um, if you steal, uh, steal a million dollars, uh, you're going to be put in jail for life. And the judge says to the uh, perpetrator, you, you, you're, 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 in, you're in jail for the rest of your life. Well, that, that's, that's the rule, right? That's the system of justice that the society set up. Let's suppose if, if you kill somebody intentionally, you're going to be executed. 
And the judge you know, tells the, the, the perpetrator, you, you know, you, you're, you're sentenced to death. Well, that, that's, the, that's the rule. In, in God's rule of, of justice, I don't know all about that. I don't think anybody knows all about how that works. But in this case, the way that played out, the Jews were so bad that at this point, they're going to be wiped out. And that was divine justice. Does that mean that God got angry one day like we would get angry? And, uh, uh, you know, I, you read now and then of a, of a judge that gets pronounced a sentence on somebody and, and, and lectures the perpetrator um, and shows emotion. Well, that's not how it works in God's realm. Uh, God doesn't have those, you know, human emotions that go up and down, you know, and, and change with the situation. His, his justice is, is fixed. I don't know where that is. But in this case, we know what happened. There's a division. There's iron there, and you're not going to get through to God. He's going to destroy it. Nothing, nothing you can do about it. Lie now, here's him. So that's that's the first kind of symbol, the first of four symbols here. This this you can imagine people parading past and think, look at that old coot, that old guy, you know, or young guy or whatever. He he's there um, with with this this here uh, Jerusalem figure and so forth. Well then, the next thing is uh, now you lie thou or lie thou, also upon the left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel. He's going to demonstrate the iniquity of the house of Israel here by this lying on the ground. Lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it, it shall bear their iniquity. He's going to demonstrate the iniquity by this demonstration. He's going to be on the ground there with that image of that city, that structure. Um, and then verse 5, For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of days, 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. Now that would be the northern, referencing the northern tribes of Israel. Now, uh, why 390 days? Well, you see, that we'll find out that there's a day per year. Why 390 days for the house of Israel? And then um, X number of days here for the house of Judah. Um, Let's read that whole section together then. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it, shalt thou bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee, and the years of their iniquity, according to the number of day, three hundred and ninety days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. Now that's why why the why the difference there. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So what do all these numbers mean? 390 days and 40 days. 40 years, 40, 390 years. What's all this? What, what, what's the significance of these numbers? Scholars are baffled by this. Maybe there are someone in the audience that is not baffled by, you know, the, this specific number of days attributed to the iniquity 
of uh, the northern tribes compared to 40 days uh, with the southern tribe uh, that for, for Judah, um, I, I have no clue. Um, but there may have been some significance. Uh, verse 7 again, Therefore shalt thou set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arms shall be uncovered. Now, the significance of the arm being uncovered. Um, various theories about that. Um, but thou shalt prophesy against it. That is, Jerusalem here specifically. In verse 8, And behold, I will lay bands upon thee. Um, now, here's another sign here. I'm going to have lay bands upon uh, Ezekiel. And thou shalt not turn thee from one... Well, actually, it's, it's part of this... this um, uh, lying on one side for or his side for so many days and for one group and so many days for the other group. I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from the one side to another till thou hast has ended the days of the siege. So, one side for the duration, the other side for the duration of the number of days specified. Now, I I assume that that, that that this this was kind of a part of a day where he was to lie there there on the ground. Um, couldn't have been day and night, um, but it, it was it was a demonstration against Jerusalem, um, showing the the magnitude the intensity of, of their iniquity. Pardon me? Where's the question? Did this really happen? Or is this just a vision? Did this really happen? Well, uh, the, I, the, vision, the vision was over. The vision, you know, the vision, uh, Barbara, the, the, the vision took place in this valley this was the second vision. It took place in this valley, and he, he was to go home, and then we, we enter into this. So this was, um, it's my understanding that this was this, he was actually instructed to do this. This wasn't the only thing he was instructed to do. Um, you know, he, he was instructed to build the, to build the, 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 the model of Jerusalem. And then he was instructed to lay on his right side his left side, then the right side for X number of days. So this 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 was happening, in my opinion. Uh, now he says, um, "Behold, I will lay in verse eight. Behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from uh, one side to another till thou hast ended the days of siege." Now, uh, apparently, God said, "Don't." You know, don't go back and forth. Um, th this this would have been a pretty difficult situation, wouldn't it? What what do you do in bed when you lay on one side and then a little while you lay on the other side? If if you're an old person like me, you you know you kind of go back and forth several times during the night. Now you young pops, you know that's different. You just go to sleep and, and wake up the next morning without you know, turning, you know, tossing and turning. So here, here's another thing. Verse 9, another symbol. He says, Now you, you take, take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches. Now, the fitches, according to King James there, some kind of a rye. Okay, so you, th this is quite a combination. Um, you know, they sell something called Ezekiel bread, right? Anyone know anything about Ezekiel bread? 
Uh, if you do, take your mask off and tell me. Ezekiel bread. Do you have any of that, preacher? Any? No Ezekiel bread. Nick, you have any? She bought Ezekiel bread. What is it? It's really tasty, you said, Nick. Huh? It's really tasty. Huh? You know, it wasn't like having a little steak and pork chops. Um, I don't know. This is the, I, I've, I've kind of read advertisements or you know some description of Ezekiel bread is supposed to be really healthy. Right, if if you can eat it, right, Nick? I mean, if it's edible. <laughs> um, going right along here. Take thou also unto thee these this Ezekiel bread, and put them in one vessel, and make thee bread thereof, according to the number of days that thou shalt lie. So. Each day you get some Ezekiel bread, what we're going to call Ezekiel bread. Okay, um, so he's, he's, this is going to be his diet. Wow, 390 days shalt thou eat thereof. And thy meat which thou shalt eat, your, your meals, your, your sustenance, be by weight 20 shekels a day. Now, I don't know what a shekel weighs, but I'm told that we're, we're talking here about eight ounces of stuff, eight ounces a day. And from time to time thou shalt eat it, and thou shalt drink also water by measure. The sixth part of a hen from time to time shalt thou drink. Um, the, some, some scholars think talk about a, a pint of water. Uh, King James here, in the center column reference here, talks about uh, a quart of water, but a pint, a quart, Ezekiel bread, uh, this, this stuff. Thou shalt eat it as barley cakes. So they you know, mix it up, bake it. Oh man, how are they going to bake it? And thou shalt bake it with. Uh, this is even gross to say, dung that cometh from a man, out of a man in their sight. Now, Ezekiel was a priest, right? And in the office of priests, you know, they, they had certain ways of preparing, um, you know, grain offerings uh, and animal offerings. And the this would be really gross, um, but it, it it would portray the the abominable uh, habits of those Jews, particularly when they lived in Jerusalem. And further along, there's going to be some discussion of that. Not only limited food, but what kind of food? Gross food. Rotten food. A terrible diet. Um, yeah.
it's on the internet, it must be true. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, that, that combination must have sustained his life during that period of time. And maybe, um, maybe uh, Nick, there is something to this Ezekiel bread that you don't... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rich says that the reason it's uh, so gross to eat is because it's good for you. So that's that's a good thing. Okay. Thank you, Ned and Rich, for your comments there. Well, um, so he's to have these um, these lentils, um, these barley cakes prepared and cooked in a gross, abominable manner. It says in their sight. So apparently, you know, there was just some idea that these people would, I mean, people would be gathered around to, to see this phenomenon. Uh, well, I suppose you had a situation where you had somebody protesting or something or trying to make it you know, make a statement, and they're out uh, laying out for 390 days, part at least part of the day. Uh, that there'd be a lot of people kind of, you know, come by and see. Well, what? What is this? Well, see that the way it was prepared, it would be an abomination. It would be, um, and as uh, Tim said, it'd be an example of uh, of the kind of food situation you'd have in, in the assault on Jerusalem. Verse 13, And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat. See, there's the explanation of it. Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whether I will drive them not only people of Jerusalem would uh, under, under assault, but those that, that escape, they would, this is the kind of rotten food, so to speak, that, that they, would, um, they would get, or this is the kind of food that they would get. Um, in verse 14, and, and then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God, Behold, my soul hath not been polluted. You know, a priestly tribe. Um, from my youth up, even till now, have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces, neither came there abominable flesh in my mouth. Um, there were certain kinds of foods that were either innately defiled like pigs couldn't be eaten if, under the Jewish economy or food that had been defiled in, in some way but he said I haven't I, I can't deal with this verse 15 and then he said unto me lo I have given thee cow's dung or, uh, well there's some modification there that might have been somewhat comforting to Ezekiel. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem. Here's further explanation here. And they shall eat bread by weight, that is, not very much, and with um, anxiety, and they shall drink water by measure, wouldn't be very much, with astonishment. So, bad situation being depicted by these symbols that Ezekiel is demonstrating. 